The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is Politically Speaking. The 2022 legislative session has officially begun, and lawmakers have a longer to-do list than usual before they gavel out in May. On this episode of Politically Speaking, we talk with Republican House Representative Dirk Deaton, who is the vice chair of the Budget Committee. That committee will ultimately decide how to spend billions of dollars in federal coronavirus relief money. It's a task he says is likely to take more than one year. We also talk about redistricting as well as a lightning round addressing other topics. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. We have to talk about things that matter to people. I've tried to bring that same aggressive iconoclast style with me to uh, the United States Senate. I think my district is a model for the state. We put Missourians first. You just kind of have to find the common ground with people. I believe that this district deserves someone who represents their values. After I came back to St. Louis, I started thinking that I could have a bigger role on the change that I wanted to make. Hello and welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, State House and Politics reporter Sarah Kellogg. Joining me is my co-host. He is the political correspondent for St. Louis Public Radio. Jason Rosenbaum. And joining me this time in the studio in Jefferson City, he represents District 159, which includes McDonald and Southern Newton Counties. State Representative Dirk Deaton. Welcome to the first recording of Politically Speaking of 2022. So, Representative Deaton, this is your first time on the show. Thank you for joining us. Um, And secondly, for our listeners, tell us a little bit about your district. Yeah, well, thanks so much, uh, Jason and Sarah, for having me on. It's great to to be with you and, and proud to be the first guest of the new year, and and I think the first guest from McDonald County as well. That is where I'm from. I represent the 159th District of the Missouri House of Representatives, which is all of McDonald County, which just for your listeners is a a bit of ways from St. Louis and is a a county that borders the states of both Arkansas and Oklahoma. So it's the most southwestern county in the state. I give my friends in Springfield a hard time. They say they're southwest Missouri. I'm like, that's, you know, two hours northeast of me, you know. But uh, southwest Missouri is where I'm from. I've got McDonald and then also a good portion of Newton County, which is Neosho and is in Newton County, the county seat. And, and Joplin is also in the northern end of Newton County. So it kind of gives people an idea where I'm uh, from, a rural area mainly, a great part of the state, beautiful part of the country. And, and how did you get involved in Missouri politics? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a, you know, I think everybody's path is a little bit different. And I've always had an interest for whatever reason in civic life and politics and and, and government. Although uh, my family was, I mean, my parents, great people, uh, you know, hardworking, uh, you know, uh, folks and, and, uh, you know, go to work and, but not, you know, politically involved and running for office and those sorts of things. And so, you know, I was able to, to uh, you know, connect with some good folks at a, at a pretty early age and uh, get involved at the at the local level. And then especially with term limits in, in Missouri politics, you know, every eight years at least, there's going to be somebody new in the Missouri House. And so the, my seat came open and I just had a, had a you know, a a sense at the time I was elected in 2018 for the first time, just a concern about the direction of the country and that I'd, I'd had for a number of years. And, and uh, my my family, my grandfather came to Missouri in, in the 60s from Arkansas, and he came to start a business, was actually quite successful. And, you know, I'm thinking, hey, are people coming to Missouri today in the decade of, you know, 2010, 2020, uh, you know, looking for opportunity is the opportunity still here that, that he had for people to come here and seize their American dream. And I was just worried about the direction our state and country were going and, and uh, felt we weren't as competitive as maybe we once were. And, and those sorts of concerns really drove me to, to get involved and run for office. And fortunately, I was successful and the people elected me and have continued to elect me. And, and uh, here we are today. And hopefully I'm able to make something of a difference. 
So we are recording this literally the day before session starts. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. What are your expectations for the 2022 session? What do you think will be prominent issues? Well, I think the best way to go into any general uh, legislative session is to have low expectations, and it's it's easier to meet them in that case. And so I try not to get too terribly excited. You know, every year, the one thing we've got to do is pass the budget. I suspect we'll talk about that at some point. This year's a bit unique in that we're going to have to pass perhaps a record number of budget bills. I mean, the operating budget, which is the, you know, for the fiscal year, and it puts, you know, state government into motion, covers the normal expenses. Uh, that always does happen. It happens in a number of bills. It's not just one bill. But then we have other bills for various other things and supplemental bills. We're probably going to have to have multiple supplemental bills uh, this year. And so it's going to be a unique year in that regard. I do think we'll get that done. We obviously have redistricting to do, and I think those are looked upon as the have-to-do, must-do items. Everything after that, you know, I don't know if you want to consider that gravy to the extent we get anything done. I think, uh, you know, due to the other uh, conditions of this year and this uh, election, people are, are, you know, encumbered with other things. Uh, it could be difficult to get, uh, you know, uh, have a record uh, year as far as legislative output, and perhaps that's not a bad thing. You know, it was Mark Twain who said, you know, the people's liberties are never in as much jeopardy as when the legislature sits. And so, uh, you know, to, to that extent, maybe it, it's not altogether a bad thing that we don't pass a lot of bills. But yet we maybe still will. I mean, I think the log jam could break. It's theoretically possible uh, that we get a lot done. Uh, so, you know, I could see it going either way, but I, I'm not necessarily thinking we're going to pass a record number of bills this year. Yeah, that kind of answers my question, which is, you know, between redistricting the billions you're going to have to allocate through the American Rescue Plan Act, it being an election year. Yeah. Do you think a lot's going to get done or you think that's kind of going to be the focus? Well, and, and look, that's a lot. I mean, the, talking about the operating budget, I mean, I, from my perspective, and again, I'm, I'm kind of a kind of on the budget track in the House. Uh, that's a full-time job in and of itself, is a heavy lift every year, uh, you know, and we get it done because we have to get it done. Otherwise, state government ceases to function and we shut down, which is not where you want to be. And so you have to get it done, but it's a heavy lift. And then talking about, yes, the all the federal dollars that are coming in, uh, that's almost like a, another budget. I mean, it is going to be another budget unto itself. And then with redistricting, I mean, these are, are heavy lifts, important items that will have an impact on Missouri for years and years to come. Uh, you know, we ought to take our time, get them right, and, uh, you know, they'll be an accomplishment in and of them, themselves. So uh, last session, the Missouri House kind of jumped between having really intense debates over controversial topics to finding bipartisan consensus on tough issues. How do you expect this session to play out, especially considering that it is an election year? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I suspect it'll be something similar to what you described. I mean, there every year since I've been here, there are those issues that are the kind of the lightning rods uh, that everybody goes into their corners and have very, very strong passion feelings on, and they're perhaps the, the topic of the day, and uh, passions run high. And we, we deal with those issues as the people who send us here expect us to. And, and based upon, you know, the district you represent and how your folks feel, then, you know, you advocate in one way or another on, on that particular item. Uh, and then there are other items that are, you know, uh, I think perhaps less controversial uh, and, and probably don't rise to that level. And they're an opportunity where, frankly, we do see a lot of bipartisan uh, support for a lot of those initiatives, and, and I think, you know, that'll remain true, and we'll probably see a, a mixture of those types of issues. So you tweeted something at the end of November that caught my attention. I'm going to read this tweet to oh, you. No. <laughs> uh, I promise this isn't a gotcha show. Uh, so you tweeted, tomorrow begins the ability for legislators to pre-file legislation in Missouri. With it begins the talking season. Discussions occur, interviews are given, articles written all about legislation that in many cases will never get a hearing and even fewer become law. So that caught my attention because, you know, it was the filing period. I guess kind of how do you weed through that legislation then, especially kind of during an election year? 
Yeah, that's a great question. It, I think it gets easier the longer you've been here. And I, you know, I don't know what the number is up to now for, for pre-filing. And, but, you know, in a general year, you could have a thousand, a thousand bills alone filed in the House, you know, hundreds in the, in the Senate. So you know, say near 2,000 bills total between the House and the Senate potentially, you know, filed in a given year. And you know what? 10 percent, a lot less than that ever is going to make it into into law, you know, and it was kind of my point there. And so, uh, you know, my first year and it is overwhelming. It's like, well, I'm going to try to read every single one of these. And, and the, the reason it gets easier is a lot of these bills that are filed, they've been filed for many, many, many years. And I suspect they'll be filed for many, many, many years to come or until they're they're passed. And so you've seen it once and you know, there can be changes, but you know, you do gain a bit of familiarity. And so the uptake is, is a lot easier as far as, you know, okay, well, I've seen this before. I, I know what this is. And so uh, initially it's, 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 uh, you know, uh, water from a fire hose, as they say. It's very overwhelming. I think it does become easier in time because a lot of these issues, you know, come back year after year. So this is the first, politically speaking, of 2022. But on the second to last day of 2021 was basically Jason Rosenbaum Christmas because Representative Dan Schall uh, introduced the draft of the congressional map that redraws Missouri's eight congressional districts. And if I had to summarize it best, and we'll we'll get in a little bit more in the weeds, it, it, it basically keeps the, the current situation largely the same. The state would have a Democratic district in St. Louis, a Democratic district in Kansas City, a, a marginally competitive district in St. Louis suburbs, and then the rest of the districts are all super Republican. Um, obviously, there's been some blowback because there are a lot of people especially on social media, who are Republican that want you all to go 7-1 and just eviscerate Emanuel Cleaver's 5th district. Um, what's kind of your reaction to the shawl map that got released? Yeah, you know, I've I've looked at it and, uh, you know, started to digest it as, as others have as well. You know, I assume it's a, I mean, it is a starting place. It's not the final, final product. So I suspect it'll you know, change in some uh, form or or fashion, and yeah, you know, I think everybody probably is most interested in you know kind of their own areas and where they come from. So I immediately looked to the seventh district, and you know, one opportunity that I thought has you know existed, frankly, um, once you know uh, Congresswoman Hartzler and Congressman Billy Long you know announced that they were running for the U.S. Senate, uh, is that you know we have a unique opportunity here, and that uh, you know. This is one redistricting cycle in which those two members of Congress, I don't think, necessarily are going to care what the 4th and 7th congressional districts look like. Uh, you know, we're a member of Congress, and I understand people want to be generally deferential to, you know, their people that are in those uh, seats or, you know, and, and, and um, you know, they, they want to understand um, what they think about it. Um, but, of course, when they're, you know, not, not running for re-election, I don't know that they necessarily – uh, care what it ultimately is going uh, to look like. And so if there was ever going to be substantive changes there, then, you know, seemingly this would have to be the uh, the time. And, and I don't know that there there will be, and there hasn't been a lot of talk about that. But, you know, I've always wondered about the 7th Congressional District, uh, for example, and, you know, the way it's it's been um, configured for so long. And, and frankly, we know, you know, the obviously, you know, I'm a member of the majority party and the Republican Party, and, and uh, you know, we uh, have strong majorities in Jefferson City now, but, you know, for much of the state's history, most of it, it wasn't the case. And, uh, you know, the other party was controlling redistricting for so long, and, and uh, you know, I suspect one time they were probably trying to pack as many of, um, you know, my Republican friends and me into the 7th, you know, uh, as you could in southwest Missouri, but, you know, I've wondered, hey, is like where I'm from, McDonald, Newton, you know, Jasper County, would it make more sense to have like an I-49 corridor district? I mean, in some ways we're very rural. I think we've got probably more in common with Barton, Dade, and, you know, Bates County than we do with uh, Springfield and, and Greene County in some ways. And, and I'm not uh, suggesting that's it's going to happen, but ideas like that have interested me. But having said all of that, if you look at this map, it looks a lot like the one we've had previously with some you know, minor modifications, and we probably stick to something more like that, I suppose, uh, just due to people's conservative nature as to, you know, not thinking outside of the box. Yeah, and one of the reasons why I agree with you on that has to do with the fact that Governor Parson did not call you into special session. And this gets a little wonky, but I'm going to try to explain this as non-verbosely as possible. So 
basically the legislature has to pass this map and it has to go into effect immediately because if it doesn't it goes into effect on august 28th and the primary is on august 2nd and i don't know about you but i don't know if missouri wants a situation where there's legal ambiguity about whether they can even have congressional primaries on the same day as the august 2nd primary like that's a nightmare scenario and unfortunately we're recording this on tuesday and i'd say unfortunately for seven to one map proponents uh representative justin hill is resigning tomorrow and you all are going to drop below the 109 member threshold which means that you likely need democratic votes in order to secure that emergency clause which in my analysis basically makes going after Emanuel Cleaver's district impossible because there is zero chance any Democrat is going to vote for the emergency clause for that. And I also think it makes it more difficult to make Ann Wagner's district significantly more Republican. I got to just ask flat out, how much anger is within your caucus at Governor Parson for not calling a special session and giving Democrats in the House this much leverage over redistricting? Well, I you know, we've been you know, in the interim, just now coming back, I've not had an opportunity to visit with, you know, many of my colleagues. We haven't had a caucus meeting, obviously, yet this year. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure that I can necessarily speak to what, uh, you know, every member of my the caucus feels. I'm sure some certainly do have uh, very strong feelings or perhaps as a, as a spectrum. I, uh, you know, to anyone who, who asked and I, you know, tried to make my opinions known to the best I could that I, you know, I was an advocate to, to come back during the interim uh, for for a special session uh, for, for redistricting. And I would have been fine even for some, some other topics, frankly, um, potentially for a, for a special session and feeling that it was needed and, and warranted. Uh, you know, that obviously uh, d- didn't happen. And uh, it is the governor's prerogative to, to call or not to call. And, and he chose not to and, and had his reasons for doing so. And, and you can understand them. I mean, they're uh, it's not that they're not uh, good reasons. And, and look, it's not, um, you know, on him alone. We do have a, a provision and the ability uh, to call ourselves back as legislators. Now, there's a reason that's rarely, if ever, uh, happened just due to the threshold uh, that it, it takes, uh, the number of, of members, both the House and the Senate, that have to sign on to such a petition makes it uh, virtually impossible. Uh, but still, if enough of us felt that it was warranted and needed, we, we could have theoretically done it ourselves. And obviously, we didn't, did, didn't do that. So, I mean, you know, it didn't happen. Here we are. We got to make the best of it. I, you know, I just hope that we don't, uh, you know, um, get beyond this and look back and, and all, you know, just objectively say, oh, well, we, you know, we should have, you know, maybe done it, um, you know, late last year um, because obviously we didn't and that's not an option at, at this point so hopefully it works out uh, smoothly and and uh, and you know doesn't cause any problems like you mentioned uh, Jason as far as the election dates and all of those conundrums that we don't want to see and confusion uh, that uh, would be needless and so hopefully we don't you know find ourselves in that situation and are able to uh, you know to, to get it done in a you know time frame that's reasonable. We need to take a quick break, but we'll be right back. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. And we're back on Politically Speaking. I'm Sarah Kellogg. I'm joined by St. Louis Public Radio's political correspondent, Jason Rosenbaum. And our guest today is Representative Dirk Deaton, who represents District 159, which covers a part of southwest Missouri. Let's get back into it. You are the vice chairman of the House Budget Committee. The first thing your committee will likely tackle is a supplemental bill that appropriates funds for Medicaid expansion. I know many of your colleagues vigorously oppose this move, but after the Supreme Court decision, do you really have another option? Yeah, great question. And that's, you know, right up there with redistricting, is, and it's a fast timeline. We, we are going to have to pass supplemental for, for various reasons, not just for our state's Medicaid program, but yes, for our state's Medicaid program. And, uh, and you're right, and this is, and, and you know, not only did some of my colleagues uh, oppose expansion, uh, I opposed expansion, and very vigorously so. I, you know, I, I was, I think, as about as involved as anybody, and as outspoken on that as anybody. And maybe it'd be helpful, and you know, please indulge me because I've not, uh, 
had the opportunity to, to uh, you know, this is this is a great form, and I do enjoy the long uh, form. I think it's helpful to these sorts of discussions, and you all are unique in, in what you offer here and, and for your listeners and, and for the citizens of the, the state. And so flattery will get you nowhere, yeah. state representative, <laughs> but continue. Well, you know, and it's 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 all all true in this case. Um, and so it's a very complex issue, I guess what I'm saying. So, uh, you know, a little background might be helpful. And, and uh, you know, a lot of your listeners, no doubt, are, remember that Amendment 2, you know, was placed on the ballot and, and placed in the Constitution, uh, although by a pretty narrow vote that expanded eligibility for Medicaid, kind of known as Medicaid expansion. And there was a pre-election challenge saying that, hey, that violated Article 3, Section 51 of the Missouri Constitution because it, it would appropriate funds. It required the spending of money. And the Missouri Constitution says an initiative can't spend money unless it raises new revenues. And this one didn't raise new revenues. And that pre-election ca- uh, challenge, the Katie decision, the court said, no, it, it, it doesn't necessarily appropriate funds. And so it can go on to the ballot. And so it was uh, passed. And then in this last session, the 2021 regular session, the General Assembly vigorously debated it. And and we determined and decided not to fund expansion, not not to put it forward. And so the executive had started to begin to try to implement it, paperwork, things of that uh, nature. And then they withdrew all of that. And then plaintiffs sued. And the trial court said Amendment 2 did, in fact, violate Article 3, Section 51, that it should be stripped from the, the, the Constitution. And then on appeal to the Missouri Supreme Court, they ruled, well, no, there was no violation of Article 3, Section 51. And further, to everybody's surprise, uh, the legislature did fund it. And now the choice is actually uh, whether or not you want a Medicaid program at all. And if you're going to have a Medicaid program, then you have to fund expansion. So your, your only decision is if you fund uh, Medicaid, then you're funding expansion. So you have a decision in the legislature, and your decision is to have a Medicaid program or not, which um, you know I don't think is much of a decision as all, and it's a very tenuous legal reasoning and, and understanding. And, you know, I'll just dispel. I think a lot of people thought there was a lot of political gamesmanship that was going on there and that this was always known to be the outcome by people like me. And I can just tell you emphatically that was not the case. And I always thought we, you know, were comporting with the law and on sound uh, reasoning. If they'd included a funding source, we would have never gotten here. It would have been implemented, no question. They didn't. And we did what we did. And now, you know, here we are. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's kind of how we um, we got here. Uh, I do think now that we're here and look, I totally agree with or disagree with the Missouri Supreme Court. I, as I've said, I think they were totally wrong. I, I, you know, you read their opinion. I, I thought it was, you know, not even a fair handling of the attorney general's arguments. Uh, they didn't even speak to, I think, his strongest arguments. They didn't even try to negate them. They just uh, passed over them. I was very dis- uh, disappointed um, in, in that. Uh, but expansion has taken place. People have started to enroll. Uh, in some ways, I think it's water over the dam um, based upon this court's reading of our legislation and the Constitution, unless that's changed, and which I don't anticipate happening uh, this year. But unless or until that happens, I think we're here. And again, the question is now, are we going to have a Medicaid program or not? So unless people are willing to completely discontinue, which I'll have that conversation if people are interested in having it, then here we are and we're going to have to, you know, fund our Medicaid program. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be put in jeopardy and and not be available for those who, you know, we've been trying to protect it for and the age, the blind, the disabled. And uh, and and so, you know, that's that's the discussion as it as it exists uh, now. Now, there has been some discussion, particularly within the conservative caucus and the Senate about doing some technical changes to the bill, which would effectively zero out funding for expansion. And I just want to make clear, I've talked to some attorneys who vigorously disagree that that's even possible, but let's just say that it is possible. The impact of that, if it was successful and survived a court challenge, would you would be kicking 50 or 60 or 70,000 people off of Medicaid. And I, I'm the last time Republicans lost a significant amount of seats was 2006 after the Medicaid cuts. It seems from like a political standpoint, that would be catastrophic if you all did that. Is that kind of your feeling as well? I mean, it, it's, it, I mean, I think it's a 
futile to consider that further. I mean, you're it, you're right. I mean, it's it's not. I mean, the the courts wouldn't wouldn't listen to that. I mean, I don't agree with their decisions, their opinions at this point. But I mean, under the uh, Planned Parenthood decision, they would say. I mean, if you're talking about, you know, zeroing out, you know, eligibility or something for. I mean, they'd say, well, you you can't do that in appropriations bill. That violate change substantive law, which is in the Constitution, which expand eligibility. I mean, they said in the Doyle decision, uh, which you know is the Medicaid expansion decision, that you know if you're going to have a Medicaid program, then you know any dollar available for Medicaid, a percentage of that dollar, you know, has to be available to the expansion population. And so, which again, I think is a gun to the head, which is what the the U.S. Supreme Court said in the NFIB decision saying states didn't have to expand because the federal government was saying all states have to expand Medicaid if you want any federal dollars. And the U.S. Supreme Court said that's that's ridiculous. That's a gun to the head. That's not a choice at all. And that was a 7-2 decision. Only Ginsburg and Sotomayor dissented on that. And so, I mean, I think that kind of tells you where the Missouri Supreme Court is at on this and how out of step they are. But here we are. So, no, I mean, that we'd be right back where we are. Uh, you know, that's just that's just not going to happen. That's what I'm saying. If at this point, the Missouri Constitution needs to be amended uh, and, if, and what was placed in Amendment 2 needs to be changed in some form or fashion, likely to see a different outcome. So I think, from my perspective, as someone who wasn't for expansion um, and thought it was a, a mistake, uh, that uh, you know now we need to talk about continue to talk about reforms and accelerate that discussion as it relates to the broader uh, program. And because it's still, before expansion, we were on unsustainable track. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, I mean, it was about to take up 40 percent of the state budget. I mean, it's just unsustainable. It's still unsustainable. Now it's even more unsustainable. So we have to talk about reforms and to bring the program and spending under control. And now that's what we need to pivot to and accelerate. And uh, you know, the time has never been better to consider those sorts of initiatives. You're an excellent segue, your representative, because Missouri is going to be getting close to a billion dollars from the American Rescue Plan for expanding Medicaid. And I, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, legislators put a few hundred million dollars in a Medicaid stabilization fund um, to for for basically what you just mentioned, which I assume could you know pay for the the state cost of expansion. With this money, though, like this money is finite. You're going to run out of this eventually. Is the focus now on changing the program to make sure that the state portion of Medicaid expansion is as low as possible? And is then the next question is, do you try to find a dedicated funding stream to pay for the state portion so you're not taking money away from general revenue five, six, seven, eight years into the future? Yeah, great question. I think that I think that's right as it relates to the um, the enhanced FMAP, uh, the five percent that we will earn on the existing population, so it's not on the state population. And the the FMAP, just you know, for your listeners, is the uh, federal uh, medical assistance percentage. That's essentially the percentage uh, that the federal government participates or pays for the Medicaid program, and and the other portion the the state would pay. And so for expanding. Under um, uh, some of the recent legislation passed out of Congress, there was a, a 5% in, in, increase in the FMAP for the existing population that they would supply to the states for four quarters or two years, which it does appear that, you know, will be around a billion dollars. And uh, I do think that all of that money, in fact, all of the enhanced FMAP uh, we get ought to be uh, tied and related to uh, defraying the cost uh, for our Medicaid program. That seemingly uh, uh, makes sense as to where those uh, funds should likely be allocated. But, but you're absolutely right. Uh, and there's you know some disagreement on how long those funds will last, when they will be exhausted. And of course, it ultimately depends on Medicaid expenditures. Uh, but they're going to run out. It's a question of, of uh, when that will be, not if. And so, yeah, then what do we do? And uh, you're right. If we don't find a, a dedicated revenue source, then uh, then it will in, increase uh, the takedown on, on GR and, and uh, be a burden there. And so, uh, yeah, maybe that's a possibility that we could uh, potentially uh, further amend Article or what was Amendment 2. is now the state constitution to see if, uh, you know, voters want to provide a, a dedicated funding source uh, or not. We do have a few years, though, probably before we need to, you know, uh, find out what that is or what that looks like. So what funding streams would you suggest? Well, I mean, 
you know, if you're going to voters, then it could be, um, you know, you're talking about probably raising some sort of a new tax. And so you could, I guess, construct it in any way uh, you want. Um, new tax is not something I'm generally supportive of. And so, uh, you know, but, but but again, that's that's where we've gotten to at this point. I mean, that's the it's the conundrum. It's like you know you got to pay for it. So how do you pay for it? And so it's general revenues we're taking from, you know, schools and all the other sorts of you know, critical government services and things uh, people want. And we have a very limited finite pool of general revenue resources. Or otherwise, you're going to have to go somewhere else. And and um, you know, uh, we'll we'll make do until or if you know a new funding source is, is identified. But uh, again, I think this really goes to. There's a reason why the proponents didn't include a funding source because they knew they it would never pass, and it's you know it was kind of a, um, a wolf in sheep's clothing here. And now here we're kind of left to pick up the pieces and figure out, try to make it work, and and we'll do the best we can. It's going to be uh, difficult, but again, and that's why we need to find savings in the program, and that needs to become the priority because I think that's achievable and scalable and something we can do. And, and frankly, we we've, we've got to do it. So we're going to uh, shift a little bit. Uh, what are your expectations for how American Rescue Plan money is divvied out this year? Yeah, and again, this is something we'll be able to do over the next few years. Um, there's a lot of uh, federal funds, uh, you know, in play here. Uh, you know, I think we'll hopefully be very deliberative about how we do it, thoroughly scrutinize it. Uh, you know, I do appreciate, I think, the governor has been very open to legislators uh, who call with questions and and of course, they're formulating their plans, and and uh, and and you know they'll soon, uh, you know, reveal. I suspect in the the state of the state, much of that, and including with their you know budget requests. Uh, but I think you know we need to look uh, specifically, uh, you know, for a, in, you know, try to work from some sort of a philosophy as to you know how to how to do this, and to make sure that we don't have ongoing liabilities or expenditures or these aren't new programs that are going to require ongoing funding because again this is one-time funding even though it can be spent over a number of fiscal years uh, it, it it's finite it runs out it won't be continuing and so you know we got to make sure we don't have obligations and, it, it, and you know that it's not wasted even if it's not on a on a, uh, a new program or something that would have ongoing expenditures is, is this really the greatest need you know maybe it's a nice shiny new object but uh, you know if the foundation is crumbling well we need to address that and I think that's going to be the challenge there's a lot of unseen needs within state government the nuts and the bolts make sure things are the trains are running on time so to speak that's the things that I hope and that we need to do and this provides a unique opportunity to do the I, I'm afraid that the challenge is going to be and there is going to be a drive to, to want to do that as you can understand we'll do some of that the, the shiny new thing uh, the new building what have you uh, and and uh, so that'll be some of the challenges so Missouri and other states have until the end of 2024 to allocate the funding you know is it possible that the state takes its time and doesn't spend it all this year. You know, maybe next year there'll be more opera funding kind of considered. Well, absolutely. Yeah, there's no, I mean, we're not going to exhaust it all this year, nor should we. I don't even think that's possible, frankly. I mean, this is becoming such a large amount of money. Um, you know, I don't think we couldn't expend it all if we would want to. It would be irresponsible. There would be no way to, frankly, uh, do it, uh, you know, appropriately. And that's still going to be a, a challenge. I mean, there's so much, you know, government spending occurring right now, and, uh, you know, and the economy is very hot. Uh, to, to get to people to, to work on these sorts of projects is going to be a challenge in and of itself. So, no, this will need to be done over a number of years. And as I speak on that, I mean, look, I... Washington has, has you know, uh, taxed in a deceitful f fashion in just printing trillions of dollars. And uh, we've seen the inflation that it's causing. And so, you know, I do think we need to keep first and foremost on our minds, uh, you know, how this is impacting taxpayers and how maybe we can give taxpayers some relief uh, based upon, uh, you know, uh, this newfound revenue that we've, we've, uh, we've discovered. And, uh, you know, because people are paying for it at the gas pump, at the grocery store. And, uh, you know, I don't think that's appropriate, but here we are. And these decisions D.C. has made, and again, states, state lawmakers, appropriators like myself, we're here trying to make the most of it. And what do you do? You're going to send this money back? I mean, that's that probably doesn't, uh, probably does Missouri taxpayers a, a, a greater disservice. Uh, but still yet, it's, uh, it, for, for, 
fiscal conservatives like myself, it's an interesting position to be in here and one yeah. that uh, you know I don't necessarily uh, always enjoy, frankly. In the last few minutes we have left, I do want to go through this lightning round where we touch on some issues and you can respond either in a yes or no answer or in a paragraph. Do you think the legislature will have to move the filing period because of the uncertainty over state legislative and congressional redistricting? I think it is um, very possible, um, potentially even likely, that that will ultimately occur. Do you think that the legislature will bar private businesses from being able to require the COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, that seems to me unlikely. I'm, I'm sure there, there, there will probably be some legislation on that, but um, the, specifically the way you asked that question, uh, completely bar private employers from requiring that? No. Yeah, I was very specific. I mean, obviously, there's the, the Biden vaccine mandate. I'm not talking about that. If the vaccine mandate didn't exist, I'd be talking about could Boeing require their employees to get the vaccine without government coercion. I want to be clear to our listeners what I'm talking about there. Um, do you think that the legislature should legalize marijuana for adult use in order to get ahead of this ballot initiative that is being circulated right now? Uh, you could make a very good argument for that. In fact, I mean, objectively, uh, probably should, uh, just based upon the experience we've had with medical marijuana and that, um, uh, you know, even if we all agree that there's some change that needs to be made, it can't be made because the Constitution would have to be amended. So t taking the legislature out of this is uh, seems like the worst possible scenario. And so, yeah, all things equal, uh, that probably would be the, be the best thing. Um, but um, it I doubt that would happen. Do you think that your colleagues will pass a requirement to show a government issued photo ID to vote? Yes, I think that's uh, it, it, perhaps not. I mean, that's one of those things that could get uh, tied up with uh, some number of other issues. But, uh, you know, I think there's a there's a very good chance that that could happen. We'll certainly hear a lot about that and other election integrity issues. I suspect something will be done on that front. Do you think that with that bill to reimpose the photo ID requirement that the legislature will expand opportunities for in-person absentee voting. So for example, you, you, there'll be a six week or three week period where you could go to your board of elections and vote early. Yeah, I'm sure that'll be a discussion. I don't know that that would necessarily ultimately be included. It's not something that I would advocate for or support. I'm a big fan of Election Day. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, we have that period of time which people advocate for their candidacy and their candidate of choice for a reason. And, uh, and that Election Day is the secure and the safest way in which to vote. And so that, that, that's not something I would look to support. And my final question, my favorite election question of all, will the legislature pass a bill that would set up a runoff for statewide and congressional elections? No. Also known as <laughs> the keep Eric Greitens out of the U.S. Senate bill. That's that's my observation, not the representatives. And that's that. So thank you so much for joining us on the show, Representative Deaton. Politically Speaking is a product of St. Louis Public Radio, which is a part of the University of Missouri, St. Louis. You can follow me on Twitter at Sarah K. Kellogg with two G's. You can follow Jason on Twitter at J. Rosenbaum. And Representative Deaton, where can people find you on the Internet where you would like to be found? Yeah, well, you can find me on, on Twitter at Dirk E. Deaton, that's D-I-R-K-E-D-E-A-T-O-N, or on any number of other uh, platforms, easily found. All right, until next time, so long. <laughs>